Thank you, Miloš. So uh, maybe I will start with a direct connection to my previous colleagues. Uh, actually, <coughs> when, I, when I saw the title uh, of, this, of this symposium, uh, it reminded me another event uh, that happened in 2010. Uh, our colleague will, will screen us uh, the web page of this project. And uh, the, the project was titled No Soul for Sale. And by coincidence, uh, as Transit Initiative, we were invited to this event. And uh, it says that uh, this festival was organized by Tate Modern in London, a big gallery. And uh, they invited 70 world most innovative independent art spaces. <laughs> it was quite <coughs> exciting invitation, and uh, but then you know uh, it's it's really interesting this title to keep it in mind while thinking about what Jakub said about this second life of the archive because actually we were happy we took invitation and then we of course asked uh, can you provide us uh, some transport money accommodation help with something and they said nothing zero you get nothing as budget but you can use state modern for four days for free and there will be millions of visitors it's great for you etc so actually we understood the invitation very skeptically so we just took some some boxes some some uh, two suitcases small presentation we went there and what was the most uh, exciting for us was that actually we made a uh, in in Turbine Hall, uh, we played uh, Stano Filco uh, sound pieces at the time. It was quite monumental. We took it just in the in the actually at the CD and we played it for ten minutes, really loud. I think he he would be really happy to to hear it. But anyway, the point was why I'm talking about that is that uh, all these 70 initiatives they were so happy to come, but then closer the date they start to ask all these questions about material support, money, etc. And it ended up that uh, the, it the even happened. But then when it ended, hundreds of emails, complaints, letters they started really to bombard the museum because actually the museum completely uh, took over their so to say independent free uh, free labor it was uh, a typical moment of kind of excavation or ex uh, how do you say it ex um, uh, it's the same with the minerals actually so extraction extraction of the of the uh, of the all uh, all their missions actually so I think to connect with the second life of an archive, I think it's extremely important to think that, of course, one uh, one thing is that the museum must uh, kind of uh, sustain and secure this uh, material integrity of the of the archive. That's that's number one, of course. But the second life, I think there is also other kind of responsibility and. Uh, Today, it's more and more visible with the museums because museums become archives and libraries in the same time. And for example, better example for me is the library. When you look at the libraries, what is a good library and bad library? For me, the best library in, in Prague is National Technical Library. Why? Not because of the books, but because they provide an open public access 24, 24 7 to 7 nobody is controlled everybody can enter so they provide a kind of uh, basic civic infrastructure for everyone and of course secondly they provide books and possibilities to study for the students and all this what what goes with with the mission of the library but then museum i think should also think about uh, while acquiring archive to adapt or to kind of think about their own functioning in relation with the initiatives or with with the programs with the missions of the of the archive of the initiatives that they are they are kind of acquiring right so and it should actually reflect the body of the institution itself not only the program to display the works but also i think to think about the the, the kind of institutional infrastructure of the museum of the gallery they should kind of at least think try or kind of moderately uh, react, change their own functioning according to the missions of the of these archives that that they are acquiring or that they are showing to the public. So that's a side remark. I will really cut it short because now I think uh, time goes on. But uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will not eat time to anyone. Yeah. 
Okay. So uh, why I came here, I think uh, mainly I was interested to hear you, what will you say, because I'm curious, uh, actually not so much about Hermit itself, because this is something that one can find in the archive, but I'm in particular interested how the experience of people that, that went through, through Hermit changed, developed, and was reflected in the 30 years after that. So to say how this, how this values that, that Hermit displayed and performed, what, what became with them? How, how you who, who were there were changing the view on Hermit what made you made change you the view, and what were the values you kept, and what were you the values that you re-evaluated in a way? Uh, I can start. I will start with one memory, uh, which is a memory of the of my visit at at Hermit, and uh, it's actually a kind of series of images that somehow reflect. Uh, while the images uh, in the book, black and white, spaces, uh, several large installations in the monastery rooms. And my memory from this, uh, from this uh, uh, visit actually somehow stays with these rooms, with these installations. But also uh, somehow th this is something that was quite crystallic, not moving. But what, what was like kind of living element of this were people, of course. And uh, it was also a certain kind of people, how they were, wear, how, what, what they were wearing. I remember that uh, there was a kind of style of, of uh, clothes, a lot of khaki things, brown, uh, combined with black maybe, not really uh, very bright colors. Uh, also how people speak, they were not uh, really, they were quiet, they were not really exuberant, showing themselves. They were moving slowly, shuffling their, their uh, feet on a little bit, you know. It, it's not a caricature, you know. It's, it's, uh, it's something that uh, me, as 20 and something here student, saw and remember somehow, you know. And it created this atmosphere, you know, that, that there was the, the, these big rooms and, and these kind of almost monkish uh, uh, people that all kind of were uh, devoted to something, right? And uh, I would go a little bit further. And uh, what, what interests me in this, or kind of strike me uh, now, when I remember or when I recall this this memory of this installation and compare it also with the uh, with the images, uh, that actually uh, the artworks were quite homogeneous. There was there was a certain look, I would say, and uh, I would call this look uh, as. A, look of reuse. Reuse is a term from architecture today. When, when you have a building, then you think kind of sustainable way how to reuse a building. But at the time, it was not really uh, a term that was used. But for me here, the, there were certain aesthetics of reuse or a look of art of reuse. And uh, this is not completely new in art, of course. We know that from Duchamp on, the, this kind of reuse, ready-made, uh, Dust and various kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, things uh, that show actually the time. It's something natural in art since, since uh, Duchamp. But here, uh, what is exception? I think two things are exception on this on this uh, reuse look. First thing is that, uh, and it's a bit science fiction, of course, that these reused things. Uh, make one thinking about time machine. That actually this, this object entered the time machine, went to the past, went to the future, and ended up there in the space. And this reuse look actually comes from this kind of physical uh, contact with, with the time, uh, time jumps. That's just uh, yeah. speculation, right? But then, second thing, which makes it exceptional comparing to, to other reused, ready-made uh, objects that we know from the galleries and the, from the museums, is the size of the rooms. When you think, you know, uh, about even about Duchamp, how he installed his objects, all this kind of uh, Arte Povera, 
later on. It's always in, in the museums and galleries, naturally, all these objects, they have pretty small room around them. While in Hermit, at least in, in this, from this memory coming, the, the spaces were, were extravagant, at least from my memory. They were really huge, big, monumental, actually. And this is this contrast in, in between reused objects and actually the generosity of the space that reminded me in the memory is something that reminds actually or is like uh, American minimalists or other would have indisponibility. So this contrast seems to me something interesting to, to, to kind of remind. Second memory uh, is related with, uh, with another, uh, with current event and uh, there is a quite uh, amazing initiative organized by uh, by a group of artists and curators that is called uh, Institute of Anxiety and they organize a festival in the forest that is called The Forest. I don't know if you if you heard about that but uh, actually it's it's a combination of uh, I would it's a, it's a symposium uh, there's a lot of lectures uh, there is a lot of experts that are invited and the, the topics range from everything that is popular today in in contemporary art field but all is kind of driven by sustainability and respect to the nature because this is happening in the forest, quite far from, from, from villages and from the cities. And there is kind of hippie also mood that people sleep there. They, they actually sleep outside and they have fun in the evening, but during the day they, they really concentrate on, on content debate and questions. So this, this is some, where, where I want, when I went there, I, I was thinking about what could be kind of pre- comparable experience I had in the in the past actually or uh, something like a role model or example for this forest uh, festival and for me it it was hermit in a way that uh, uh, this this uh, why because not because of, of this kind of community autonomy but mainly because of the of the question of sustainability that it raised and here comes uh, one question or thing, I think we should really uh, uh, super focused on one one uh, element and it's a matter of historical studies, I think, is how, how the movements of ecology in the 1980s, in late normalization, connected actually with this Western, Western and European and other movements of sustainability and they met at the Hermit. And this meeting seems to be something very interesting for me today and look at this uh, uh, very moment because it was something uh, completely unusual for for the time when the consumption begin. And here uh, maybe we can, I would like just to end with this, to connect it with, uh, with Michal Pullman, with the Czech historian who kind of rewrote the, the, the history of the normalization a little bit. And interesting things he, he noticed and he, he says, first thing is that there was a kind of uh, in the 1980s, in Czech Republic at least, I think in Poland it was the same thing, there is a kind of uh, consumption drive. There, really, there, there is a consumption drive and there, there is a regular actually uh, uh, kind of will and, and desire to consume. And there, is, there were even uh, things to be consumed. So it's, we think that it was kind of a non-consumeristic society, but actually it was in the 80s, very much driven by this only interest because there was not, not much else to, to, to think about besides of this and then circus, for example. So first moment is this, that it went against this, uh, uh, against this consumerism that was already present in the 1980s. And Pullman then says he, two other interesting observations. One is w what was internal reasons for failure of socialism in Czech Republic? His hypothesis was that it was uh, first was related with a certain signals of uh, non-ability of the state to handle danger groups, danger issues like fo football hooligans, for example, or certain uh, elements in the society, and they escaped a little bit this this kind of. Uh, uh, socialistic control. And the second element that escaped was the movement, ecological movement, actually, he says. And he observes, for example, music festivals like Porta or official magazines like uh, Mladý Svět, where this kind of uh, uh, ecological movement really find official platforms. And this was kind of internal 
disintegration that that showed that uh, the, that the the situation is uh, is shaking. So that was his hypothesis. And my uh, interest would be to somehow see what role in this development Hermit followed or maybe stopped actually, or kind of uh, in in which relation it is situated. Thank you very much.